Um, my name is Cheryl Atkinson. I'm a prof here at Ryerson, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you. It's a nice big crowd tonight for this lecture. Um, we're very pleased to host Juan Busquets and his wonderful exhibition. Um, I am uh, only going to give a brief introduction to um, the event and our sponsors, and then I will turn it over to Sheila McCartney. So tonight's lecture is a joint endeavor between the Department of Architectural Science and, the, and Ryerson's School of Urban Design and Regional Planning. And it's been sponsored by the OAA, the RAIC, and uh, Ryerson and Hempson Simpson, the Hempson Simpson Lecture Series um, through uh, Urban and Regional Planning. So I will turn it over to Dr. Sheila McCartney, who is an ex-student of, of Joan's and a co-curator of the exhibition. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land that we stand on and we gather today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. The territory was the subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for resources around the Great Lakes. This territory also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, and today is the meeting place in Toronto, is still the home of many indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we are grateful for this opportunity to meet as a community on this territory. I want to again acknowledge our donors, uh, the uh, Ontario Association of Architects and the Royal Ar Architectural Institute of Canada, and also the founders of the Hemson Simpson Lecture Series, which started as a gift from two sisters to the School of Urban and Regional Planning, uh, from their father, who is a founder of Hemson Consulting, and to create a joint series of current leaders uh, with the Hemson Consulting with Craig Binning and Russell Matthew, who wasn't able to join us here tonight. So we'd like to thank them for their generous gift that continues on this discussion. So this is one of the cl first collaborative ventures that uh, Professor Atkinson mentioned, that in recent years between the Department of Architectural Science and the School of Urban and Regional Planning. And it's been terrific working on this lecture with my colleague, uh, Cheryl Atkinson, uh, of Department of Architectural Science, and also Marco Polo, who is the curator uh, at the Paul H. Cocker Gallery. And we look forward to many more collaborations together. So the theme that we've been exper uh, exploring at the School of Urban Regional Planning this year is that of paradigm shift and challenging the understandings of the discipline and preconceptions when we think of cities and recognizing how planning and design and architecture inter intersect in many of your lived experiences that previous models of planning and urban design don't work for everyone and that they've leave some people behind and the issues outside of the discussion. So we want you to think about new ways to look at issues in the city and tonight Barcelona is serving as an international case study through the series of critical studies and attempted urban transformations since the 1980s and contrasted with issues emerging in the global discipline debate on urbanism today. Juan Busquet is bringing his lifetime of exceptional contributions to culture, society, and social science due to his impressive and multifaceted overture in the field of city planning. So we understand that many of you in this discussion issues may be new topics, and we encourage you to listen and even to begin to challenge your own thinking and biases within your education and your practice. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Juan, Dr. Juan Busquets. He's an internationally renowned Spanish architect and urban planner, he holds professorships at the Technical University of Catalonia and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. His firm Bau, which is the Barcel Arquitectura de Urbismo in Barcelona, is based in Barcelona, and he was awarded the 2011 Erasmus Prize, an annual award for the person who has made an exceptional contribution to European culture. In 1969, he graduated from the school of Escola Tecnica Superior Arquitectura in Barcelona, at the University of Catalonia, Busquets was a professor of town planning in the School of Architecture at the Polytechnic Architecture, sorry, Polytechnic University of Barcelona from 1979 to 2002. And since 2002, he's been a professor at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University and holds their chair of the Martin Boscom Professor in Practice of Urban Planning and Design. In addition, he has been a visiting professor at several universities. Importantly, Juan Busquets headed the planning department of the Municipality of Barcelona between 1983 and 1989 during the preparations for the Olympics in 1992. 
He's written many impressive works, including the short list of some of these projects, including the master plan for the city of Coruña in Spain, Grotius Place in The Hague, Forum Visu in Portugal, and a housing complex in Manquista in Barcelona, Community Center and Block E in Rotterdam, the Centre Helmond, Master Plan in Delft, the Fear of Barcelona proposal for the hospital, and the city, sorry, the Centre Plan for Toulouse. He's also written many impressive works, including what I say a short list, which one has been one of every year for the last two decades. Some of my favorites are Barcelona, the evolution of the compact city, um, work that came out of his original dissertation, which links to my work as well, which is the Urbino Ur Marginal, uh, working on Toledo, Harvard Yards, uh, New Orleans, the 10 lines, a new, uh, new lens for the urbanistic project, Catalonia Continental, uh, work on Beijing, another book on Quito, another book on Serra, uh, Barcelona, the future reality versus the project, which involved many students at Harvard at the time, including myself. Uh, urban Surplus, and as well the books that we're celebrating tonight of this exhibit, which is Redesigning Gridded Cities of Manhattan, Chicago, Guangzhou, sorry, Guangzhou, and Barcelona. He also has upcoming works on Savannah, Chongqing, and I understand a uh, grid tome of 700 pages, which will be coming out in the next year or two. What is personal to me in this introduction is that Juan, how Juan Busquets guided me in my dissertation completion at Harvard, but how by example he demonstrated and nurtured my teaching through example, using lecturing and engaging the student body through projects, studios, and the research. He's been an anchor for establishing scholarship of collaborative process-focused, empirically measured, built environment, building local capacity, and built spaces that are orienting towards bringing about real change in places. To engage students in efforts to bridge the gaps between theories and practices of planning and urbanism, in order to broaden their perspectives on boundaries of urban planning and urbanism, along with many of the allied disciplines, with the ultimate goal of enriching how cities look operate and field. His passion for education across discipline boundaries awakens curiosity and urbanism in many students, modeling creativity, inclusiveness, and a passion for learning while inspiring critical reflection and critical thinking. His work centers around the interdisciplinary relationships between urban form, human culture, and the land in which it is built, with the overarching objective to understand the increasing contested terrain in which the interests of capital, the state, and citizens struggle for control and build their natural environment. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Juan Busquets. Okay. Thank you very much um, to the University for the invitation. Thank you. Sheila for the, the introduction, and thank you for the team that uh, prepared the, the exhibit, uh, which I think is very nice to see again, and to see in different shape. The exhibit that you have here started uh, two years ago in Barcelona, that was the, the original exhibit, it was the idea uh, of this exhibit that we are going to see now, uh, and try to develop some ideas about what is an exhibit about the city when you present the city is probably few of you know personally, but other people know only as a reference or something in the book. I think we can use a city, and that is what I like to do tonight, even that we don't know the city, but we can imagine that the problems, the main issues that one city suffer, personally, we can do the same exercise if we take Toronto, or Boston, or any other city, any what we call a capital city, in a way that cities that they have a certain protagonist, a certain dimension, certain capacity, that at the same time cities that they are also related to other cities. Yeah? That's the reason that in our title we put metropolis of cities. It's the way that I don't feel that today we can speak about the capital city thinking that the city is alone, always the city is a group of cities. Yeah? And I think this demands us a new concept about the cities, yeah? because if not we are always insisting with uh, the old concepts of the 70s, when they are talking about the they know all of this, this type of phenomena. But today the cities are demanding new concepts. And I want to develop a little bit this idea today. This is the way that the city was presented. The city, uh, this exhibit was uh, reformulated in Cambridge at the GSD. We did that fall 2016. After that, the exhibit was redone in Shanghai, probably a new. Uh, they refurbished this silo and they uh, <coughs> use the privilege that they use this exhibit.
activity in this gigantic building, you know, the and I was mentioning before the surprise for me is that this exhibit was attracting 25,000 people every day during the weekends. Amazing. In Barcelona, we were able to attract, even as was the exhibit of the city, five, six thousand per during the, the weekend. But anyway, Shanghai weren't <laughs> leading that. It's a big city, in a way. But anyway, I think what is interesting is you can say, why these people could be interested in the city that they don't know anything about the city? This is Barcelona. Some of you perhaps know the city. I like to say all the cities, I mean, you are, today we discover, well, immediately many of the cities are very much water related. Eh? I think that probably is the same, the same important issue in, in Toronto and many other cities. I mean, the relation with the water is important. And we recently discovered that the water is important in our cities in the last decades, few decades, before the water was not important, it has other uses. Now Toronto is going to the water, Barcelona and <coughs> Paris as well, because for many years the water has been used for other reasons. But at the same time we can see that any city has this uh, phenomenon, has a certain geography that is important, then the city is in the middle of that. And then suddenly we start thinking how this city, how we can understand the city. And I think this is very, very important that we should be able to understand and to research one city to make it possible that the people can understand the city immediately. Yeah. I propose an exercise like that and I'm sure we could do the same if we are looking Montreal, Toronto, or Boston. Our cities morphologically can be, there are some concepts that we can immediately understand. You can follow, and probably you, you know, Barcelona can be explained with the center, is what we call the old town, that was a wall of town. Toronto doesn't have this old town, it was tiny piece. But then you have a development, which is, in the case of Barcelona, is gigantic, is what we call the Serra project, the mid of 19th century. And then you have many uh, development that I call the, I call that the A, the B, and the C. And then you have other things that happen outside, that is what we call the metropolis, which in fact can be explained with another type of world. You allow me this hypothesis, and we can do something like that, and I think any city can be understood with less than, almost in one hand, eh, when we make that. And we need to understand how a city works in terms of the morphology, but also how the city is operating. Usually then we need to understand how the traffic is organized, how the functions of the city are organized. But also we always need to understand how the city is a social condenser and how this social organism that is a city, how that can be improved. And finally we can say that all the cities need also certain better relation with the nature. How the city related with the water, with the mountains, with the system. Those are the points I'd like to develop today using the example of Barcelona, but I'm sure we can apply it to many other cities with the same example. The reason I'm presenting that today is because I feel our cities are facing new problems. Our cities in general have been designed according to the demands of the 20th century, where were the new mobility. And I think this is today very much still, you can see this image. This is birds. This is a Photoshop exercise. It's not real, eh? but, but you can agree with me that Paris is really a city that is still today, is changing, but it still is very much traffic and car oriented. And in general, all our cities are very much car oriented. We are trying to, to get rid of it, but still the car is very present in the way that our cities are organized. And probably the way we design the cities today are still too much car oriented, okay? And then you can see that probably in the 70s, this is a, an image of our architecture de Jouy. That that was published in mid 60s, and you you can agree with me that one architecture de Jouy was the leading magazine, I would say, in the architectural field. The director in that moment was Bernard Huet. He was a very good architect. He worked with Lucan. He was very well, a sensible person, very co cultivated, cultural, culturally. 
But you, you can agree with me that publishing that means that they were a certain fascination for the car, the, the things that the car were produced. Huh? You can agree. I mean, this is one way. Today, we feel that we like to get rid of that, but still we have to invent other type of things that are the ones that we want to, to say today. When we are discussing today about mobility, we are trying to, we, we, have, we have other elements. And we are considering that mobility needs to take into account many other factors. It's not only the car, there are other ways that the mobility are, but still mobility is still there. I want to try to use the example of Barcelona to present to you what are the main issues that we are tackling when we are designing the city today. But we have other fascinations today. And I like just to use this term because I think it's fantastic that we are fascinated about what we do. But at the same time, we have to double check about the solutions that these fascinations are bringing to the table. And that is my point I want to bring today. If we continue with the, that, well, we can see that the cars today are still uh, leading our discussions. I think we can do this exercise. And today, we know that the car is going to be, but still, we need mechanic elements that probably will help people moving around the city. I'm going to address six main issues that they are probably touching the way we are researching the city and the way we are working into the city. One is the changes that they are provoked by the, by the global connections. When we are talking today about what is a megalopolis, like probably in the 70s they were trying to address, we discovered today that it's very difficult to define what is the space of this city. What is the, because the cities are so connected, uh, virtually and physically, that it's very difficult to imagine how we can move on. Huh? For instance, if you take the example of Europe, this is the place of Barcelona. You can see that it's not a city, it's a system, but the way that Barcelona is connected with all this continuous seating from Valencia further down until Marsella and entering Italy, you can say it's medical. Where are we cutting the limits of the city? And the city doesn't have limits. We know. That's the way then when we're talking that you can enter into Toulouse and this is Lyon and this is Paris. It's the way that that is a system that probably in the North American context there are, but we can see that there are also this phenomena. And when we take into consideration the system, how they operate in, and the virtual connection to the cities, we discovered that this is quite, quite continuous. And then what happened is that if you do this exercise, this is the traditional map of Europe, when you put, you start putting how the, the highest speed train is operating, <coughs> you can see that in the end, France, that is a huge country, it becomes like a, a gigantic, a very thick corridor. Yeah? because all the high speed train makes that from the north of Europe to the south of Europe, you are passing always this corridor. Because the way when you draw the time and not the real, the physical map, the, the, the countries are and the spaces are shrinked. And so way, that is what we can see. Then in this circumstance is when we start thinking the relationship between the cities has to be completely reconsidered. And I think this is what I like uh, very much to address now. Okay. For instance, when we look at uh, the case we are entering in Barcelona, this is probably the city that uh, we can call the municipality of Barcelona. This is approximately 1.8 mi million, uh, uh, 1 million, 800,000, which is approximately the same dimension than Paris and the same limits, the geographical limit. But Paris has between 9 and 10 million, Barcelona has this map will be 5 million inhabitants, as well as half of Paris. But the municipality is like Paris, as well, but what you would say, the continuous city is about 1.8 uh, million inhabitants. You can see the shapes of it, but we, what is important for us is the idea that then we can see that within this 1.8, you have these different ABC that I'm going to describe. The old city looks like this. You can see that morphologically any old city is fully done by fragments. 
the fragments of the history, you can follow with me, that you can see the Roman town, you can see the Cargus and the Cumanos, or as you can see then the Faubourgs, the lines that they were exiting from the walls into that, and the way that the city was developed with the second wall and a third wall until mid of 19th century. If we have to work as designers, eh, you're going to see that for me, I don't make a difference between an architect, an urban designer, and a planner interested in the city. For me, these disciplines should share a lot of knowledge. And, and I think it's very important to understand how we can share the concepts and how, when we do the, the actions, perhaps there are people that they are more interested in the strategy of the city, that they are probably the planners, or the people that they are working on the fragments of the city, usually are the urban designers, or the people that they are thinking more on the objects, and those are the architects. But I like very much that architects, and I myself, I feel, and I've been trained as an architect, and I'm interested in the city, but sometimes, and I think what is, I invite very much to the students, to consider that we have to share different scales. We cannot limit ourselves to, like, I'm an architect, I, I'm only object guy, no. You are an architect, but you are committed with the city. That is my approach. I respect very much when I see buildings done like objects, like beautiful objects. I like that very much, but I don't share. For me, it's not the priority. That's the way I feel, and that we can agree. Today, fortunately, there are many approaches running in our discussions, but I'm very interested in this idea that the city, that any fragment of the city can be considered with the surroundings and then probably the form and the shape of the building is responding to that. But at the same time, this particular shape is responding to certain social conditions, a certain economic conditions. And I think this is what something that I like uh, very much to stress. This is the old town, a beautiful old town, but not very exceptional old town in particular. I cannot say that in public because it looks so but anyway, it's, it's true. I mean, there are many other cities that have better old town. <laughs> but you have to live with your own conditions when you work <coughs> with the city, and then you have to accept and to say how you can improve it. But the person has this gigantic project, which is, this project is 1855. Remember that the project in Manhattan, the extraordinary in Manhattan is 1811. In 1855, one guy, the name is Terda, C-E-R-D-A, was able, a city like that, that was wallet, you can see that the city was wallet, the space was empty, and made this gigantic project, making the city 10 times bigger. The people of this guy say, this guy is crazy. It's, it's not, doesn't make any sense to make a city to that scale. But fortunately, this guy was making this proposal to make the city rational and to ensure the city for more than 100 years, the school. And because of that, we can say Barcelona today is a city that is a big city. Otherwise, Barcelona will be a provincial town like many other cities. And I like to stress this point. There are certain moments where a project, a project with ambition, is able to change the scale of the city. We can say probably the same thing. We did the exercise last year with my students, and we compared Manhattan, the project of Manhattan, and the project of Savannah, two projects that, that you know very well. Savannah project, it was bigger than the Manhattan grid. Nobody agrees with me, but if you look at we did this exercise. It's gigantic. But this project was out of the scale of the capacity of the Savannah to be developed. And I think this is what is important, that we can make projects that are gigantic and very ambitious, but we have to put in a way that the, the economic forces make the project happen. And that is what happened in the case of Manhattan and the case of Barcelona. We see this project that today, it, it looks uh, like that. You can see how the project was implemented. You can see that the land, the, the, the form of the geography has nothing to do with this regularity, nothing to do, and the project is there. And the project is the one that makes this city so fabulous today. And also the architecture is so important. Because sometimes the people say, Barcelona is Gaudí, that's true, Gaudí is fantastic. But when you look at this, you see Gaudí, you see Pucci Cadafal, and you see Domenic Montaner. The three masters next to each other. But why the three masters are making so contribution? Because there is one 
wider plan, ambitious plan that put them together. The Arnubo people, they were crazy. They were like our postmodernists in recent days. They are fighting each other. They want to say, I'm the one, I'm the best. Everybody wants to be the best in terms of architecture. But they are put together into the logic of these blocks. And I think it's what made this city so extraordinary. I think the same that's happened in, in Manhattan. In Manhattan, you, you can see the most extraordinary buildings, the most normal buildings, the standard buildings, but they are playing together and making the city. That's the reason I feel that this type of city is a city that makes <coughs> our cities strong, but probably even in the future, these type of cities are going to be something that we are going to use for, for many years. That was to be. That was the great project. But when you look at the obscures, what happened in Barcelona, you have all these type of different forms. Morphologies that they are very fragmented. They are independent, eh? that mostly housing or uh, warehouses were their uh, economic activity. You can see the representation, and that is the way to exhibit. What to do? When you want to improve or you have a certain capacity of improving the city, what is the mechanism? You cannot use the same mechanism for A, B, and C. Probably the project should be slightly different because they have to understand how the morphologies can be. Yeah? And then you can see that those are the period where uh, these projects, mainly in the 80s and the 90s, were quite uh, popular in, in Barcelona. That they were developing many of these plazas and gardens and parks into the city. Yeah? I think this part is, is quite well published and quite well known, but I think that was a certain idea of the city that was considered a very low-key city eh, in, until the 80s. The city was trying to redevelop and they were using the public space as the main spin-off for changing the quality of the city. Second question for me that is very important is how we can increase and we can improve the social justice. <coughs> Today is something is a second issue that many of our cities are facing. How we can do that? If we use the, the example of the research that we did for Barcelona, it's very important the way that the social housing is organized and the facilities, the public facilities that the people can, can have access to it. When you see the old town, you can see that there are a lot of uh, spaces where by improving or creating the continuity and establishing new facilities, meaning uh, schools, meaning uh, places for seniors, you can improve the quality of the city. Then you can see that you take that, the design strategy as an element to put many of these buildings, eh, social housing, certain public facilities, that they can attract, and that is the map of the city that's been representing all these elements together. Eh. By mapping, we discovered, honestly, when we did the research, this drawing never happened before. And we produced this, the research and they said, hey, it's not so bad. But then you start looking that the scale of the facilities in the city center were smaller. And as far as you go to the outskirts, because they have more spaces, the facilities are bigger. Yeah? And probably that you can imagine that then you can classify that in different types. You can start thinking that perhaps the buildings that you do as a facilities, you put a space in front of it. And then you, re you recover this idea that any public building has a plaza in front of it. If that is a school, the parents can meet the, the kids in this plaza. If that is a library, the people can meet in that place. And so it, that is something that you can discover and you can put in place in a strategy like that. But even when you go to the outskirts, what we call the C and D in the morphologies, Perhaps the most important is not only the buildings but and the plazas, but could be how these buildings and plazas are linked with pedestrian itineraries and the people of bicycle, you know, and then you create a network of places, civic places, that the people can enjoy doing. I feel when we're talking the just social justice is very important, that the people have access to these facilities, public access and easy access to these facilities. I think this is what probably this research uh, conclude. For instance, you can see the change. This is the same place. The place in the outskirts. 
the outskirts of our cities are really <coughs> very poor. Even in Barcelona, you can see today, some people are visiting Barcelona and say, hey, it looks so nice. This city has been always very nice. You have LD, everything is fine. No, the city was like that. You see that, what is the quality of this space? There is no quality. This is the same space. What you did here, you put some cars with some parking facilities, you put the subway on it, and then you create what we call a rambla, the space where the people, but the buildings are the same. And I think this is very important because sometimes we feel that the improvement of the city means demolishing the city. No, improving the city means working with the strategies that the buildings can be reshuffled, and then immediately when you do that, start the ground floor flourishing with the small Starbucks or whatever. I mean, that's the way these type of activities that happen everywhere. But if there is no quality, these activities are ever always residual. They are never taken as, as elements, as important elements. Another important question in this discussion was the, the courtyard of this central part that I was mentioning before. I think the courtyards are always critical because you have these is very dense and you can see with with the type but fortunately in Barcelona the blocks are approximately the blocks are very precise 130 meters the streets are always 20 meters it's very easy to remember three blocks makes 400 meters then perfect yeah. I think always is very good to have certain certain elements our job is complicated. We have to work a lot and sometimes. But in the end it's very important that we have a conclusion that people can say, okay, four hundred meters, that's clear. Okay. Because everybody can remember. If you don't if you put three hundred and ninety people say, hey, it's not four hundred in the way that I think it's important that the outcome of our job the people can understand and can follow. If you do that the perimeter block, then you have a space in the middle which is approximately between 50 and 60 meters per 60 meters, which is a good space for protection. And then you have these type of spaces that if you open to the public, you can get very interesting spaces to people to enjoy. I remember when the project in Barcelona was done, mid of 19th century, Ferda, the author of this project, that he was a sort of engineer architect, he was not making a big difference. He said, okay, I'm builder of the city. He said something. The, our city needs parks, but not everybody likes the parks. Because the people, the kids and the elderly people, they prefer spaces, control spaces. And those are the courtyards. I mean, I, I'm always wondering how this guy has this type of intuition to say, okay, we, sometimes we feel green, as, as open as possible, attention. Some people don't feel safe in these green spaces. Then they want other type of spaces that we can say more like this. But also, when we're talking about the, the open green, the other dimension, then is where you have that. The green can be also a link between communities. No? Then you, the park, you can see in that case, over the highway. Then by doing that, you establish places where people can meet, yeah. like these spaces. Yeah. In general, you can see, when we look at that, it looks beautiful, and it is beautiful. When we look at how the buildings are, the buildings are very, in general, very poor. Because Barcelona was a city that recovers the spaces after 40, period, uh, 40 years period of the, the Franco period, and the dictatorship. Franco was not interested in Barcelona, not interested in the quality of the the living, uh, the working class. I uh, was interested in other, other things, other priorities, and uh, I'm escaping to mention. But I think what is very important is that today you have to, by acting on the public space, you can re, uh, uh, you can reshuffle the way that these communities, that they are working class area, can be also um, improve by certain facilities but also by the quality of the space which is there. Third important issue today, and I mentioned before, the changes in mobility patterns. If you take the example, and that probably is the future, that was the past, and remember some of you know this book, and we were structuring from Brian Richards. 
that was himself uh, in that uh, attempt to put other forms of mobility. Uh, this is 64. Uh, just to mention that the discussion we have today is really a very important, uh, important issue. We have this. When when you look at the case of Barcelona, you can see that the city was organized very bad. The highways were straight to the middle of the city, and that creates a very difficult uh, congestion into the city. The city tried to develop something that making the connection of the entrances, and it resulted out to something of that, which is not uh, the ideal, but that probably was was necessary to be done in the 80s. But in the last 20 years, the building, the city, the last 30 years, built all these, I call that spaghettis, hmm? places where you, the junctions. When you put the, the junctions together and you put them together, that's the space that you consume is twice the space of the third area. It's amazing. But it's done. Fortune is there. Uh, you, have, uh, you know, you are familiar to that. I think all cities, unfortunately, we are familiar to that. But when you look at carefully, you can see, and I think this for me is very important, is that those are the spaces of opportunity. Those are fantastic places where you can start if you look at how the buildings, the frontages, the opportunities, and you can do a lot of interesting projects like this project, and then you, you cannot do certain things in the middle of that, but you can do certain sports facilities, certain parks that they can be used in a certain hours. So I, I feel that this is a, an important, then we start modeling these spaces and then creating a light, and then the people start discovering that those are spaces that they are huge, but without use. They perhaps could be spaces where bicycles can cross a minutes away. Huh? Exercise that, in terms of architecture and urban design, I feel they are quite uh, useful and quite convenient. And that's the one that I mentioned before. Yeah. And that could be the way that you can start thinking. Yeah. But you have that system. And then we discovered, we did a research about that. I'm sure you have the same problem. I know the the famous case of the highway uh, approaching the city, and sometimes we feel what to do with these elements. Huh? The first thing is you ask yourself what these elements are for. And then we discover that in these elements, like your uh, famous highway, there, in the case of Barcelona, there were 50% of the cars. You know, I imagine that some of you are driving cars. No? When you drive a car, your attitude is completely different when you go from one end to another of the city, or when you go to the center and you go to pick up somebody. The same car and the same driver has a completely different attitude. One I call a metropolitan attitude or an urban attitude. In Barcelona, these two are 50-50. 50% of the flows are people whew, going from one end to another as fast as possible, and others are urban traffic. I'm not saying what is good, what is bad, but this is. And then we discover that perhaps if we do that, we can imagine that we detach the traffic, the long, uh, the metropolitan traffic from the other. And that was the system that was in place. In a way that then you have a system where you have 50% of the, the flows that they are running at 80 kilometers per hour without stopping. If you go faster, you are going to be a ticket for sure. So then you, you get people with a certain speed, that is a suitable control, and the others are people that they are using the city. And when you have that, this is very difficult in the city, then you can make a layer with some facilities, even because those houses doesn't have parking, then you can provide that, and then you have a space like this, which is a space very much uh, pedestrian oriented. You can have some cars, but those cars are part that they are going to this place, is the land, which is a different attitude than the, the car that is going faster. You can see these type of things, yeah, by the way, that is like the high line in Barcelona. Yeah, it was opened one year ago. That is not as beautiful in terms of design, it's a little bit simpler in terms of the materials, but nevertheless, it's, it's a very successful place. Then I think we have to struggle 
even that we are very much in favor of considering today that we have to play with different forms of mobility and we have to create we have to enhance what the French call the soft, uh, the model, uh, the, the soft uh, modes of, of mobility, uh, meaning the pedestrian should get the priority into the city and the bicycle. But nevertheless, the public transportation needs a space, but also a car or some mechanical form of mobility going to stay, uh, to exist. And that I feel is something that we have to struggle and to consider. The fourth challenge is about the economy. That's the way I think all the cities today are struggling about the new forms of economy. What are they? And then when we do this exercise, and probably if you do that in Toronto, you are going to come, most probably, that you have something which is quite well established in the, let's say, the downtown or the city center, where you have a lot of uh, networks. But also, as soon as you take the metropolitan, you, you discover many other type of flows and connections that they are, most of them, here you can control very much with the public transportation, pedestrians and bicycles, but when you are moving out, still the car is the protagonist. No point about that, I think in general, in Europe, you have to accept that, even that we don't like this model, but this is the model, because a lot of people are living there, working there, the, the wife there, and work at that family, that then the public transportation cannot be efficient at that scale as far as we have today with the resources we, resources we have. If, we, if you take that then, you, an, you analyze and then you can see that the city center is where the places that the public transportation is leading, eh, the people are walking and that, and then as, as soon as you are more connected with the industry and other uh, uh, sectors are moving in that direction. The center, you can see that then you, you can recognize the access. Eh. I think I insist very much that the research is very much about establishing categories and mapping. I think we have to map. But we have to map with intention. Sometimes today, because the GIS, we imagine the GIS solve everything. No, the GIS needs somebody that makes the interpretation of that. Otherwise, the, the GIS produces nothing. Eh? And we need our categories. We need our hypothesis about that. And I think this is what this research it was about. Then we discovered that in the compact city, that is uh, like any central city, that could be uh, Boston, could be Toronto, you always have in the city what they call, our city's looks, when you take the Google, the city's looks finish. It seems that everything is there. And then I propose always to do this exercise. You start knocking, and then you discover that our city has empty spaces. Those were the empty spaces in the city. When you have these empty spaces, you ask yourself why these spaces are empty. They are not very full of activity. Those are places, all industries, uh, rail yards. Uh, there are many of these things that explain the, the reason of that. Yeah. And then is when a planning strategy is very useful. Because if you put these elements in the same uh, screen, you can start thinking if those elements cannot be the, the places where certain type of economy, certain type of housing, or certain facilities could be. Eh? And that was the strategy we designed with what we call the central test program. Empty spaces like that can become like this. Eh? You see, places where you can integrate two schools, a private building with economy. I mean, this is a a quite prominent building, and that is uh, Lilla, that's the name, which is uh, the building. Or you could discover access where you have also empty spaces. And those places, probably, you can develop new activity. This activity is going to create a certain plus surplus value. We know that. But if we put that, part of this surplus value can, can go back to the community. I think I feel that planning has this power. If we have a clear strategy for the city, we can address this question, and then we can produce a certain type of social housing or facilities that otherwise is going to be very costly for the public sector to buy this land or to produce that. Eh? I insist that this is very important. And we have to be aware. As designers, the designers, our job has a lot of capacity and has, if you want, 
I could say, a lot of power, a lot of capacities of changing things or influencing the way that the things can be changed. I know that in the end it's going to be a politician that makes the choice, but we can help advise. I think universities also can bring in the studios quite a lot of new ideas about this process. And that, for instance, that was another exercise in Barcelona that is called the 22 Act, meaning that this is the, the place where the new economy, that is a, a, an all industrial sector into the city, that being uh, completely derelict and abandoned, and then probably gives the opportunity by introducing new service to create the space, which in fact is, is very popular, but you can see that there is a mix of old buildings and new buildings, creating a sort of um, special sector where you can develop a new economy, meaning related to the digital world, some part of housing and service economy. I think it's, it's been quite, uh, some of you perhaps interested to notice this uh, exercise, and I think it's going quite well. Mm -hmm. the way it is then you discover that when you, uh, this project today is almost over, meaning that when you want to start inducing startups and all this type of activity, that's very good in the area, an industrial area, but as soon as that is uh, successful, plant prices goes up, then it's gone. No more startups, then you have to search for another place because it becomes really integrated into the market. But that's that's the normal thing. We have we learned that eh? and we have to, to be aware of that. Eh? But nevertheless allows you to enter into a dynamism that for this area, for this reason, is being very successful. And for instance Taking advantage of certain opportunities in Barcelona, we have the airport very close to the city, and that's the four. So wait, those are the two important machines that you can you can make it work in a different way for the city. The fifth element is about how do we like the city of the future, and we said we like very much to take into consideration that the, the environment should be more present into the city. I think that's something that we like, and all these ideas we like to share. The question is how we can develop. It's like the sustainable city. All we are in favor of sustainable, but how we can get it done? And what, what are the process for that? And what is the design strategy for getting it? When you look at the city that I was describing, ABCD, and you take the rest, the rest is 50-50 by chance. I, I'm pretty sure if you do this exercise in the metro Toronto, you're going to see something like that. I think there are certain things that they are quite common in our cities because there are a lot of the spaces that, because there are areas uh, flooded, uh, risk, uh, whatever. I mean, there are many airports, protections, uh, there are many of these places in cities. Then if we look at and we start designing the rest then you discover another another reading of the city. In general, we, because we tend to be, we look at very much buildings, but sometimes <coughs> we need to do the exercise, look at what is unbuilt, and then you have this map. And this map allows you, and it's a lot of owners, uh, a lot of people interested in making buildings in those places, but you can uh, start thinking, that is a research we did at Harbour, in this uh, park, uh, we call that the agricultural park, which is next to the airport, and the airport, the runaways are protecting the park, then there's an advantage sometimes to have the airport is good because then you protect the, the land and so on. These type of things are always things that then you can imagine how you can organize. You have that, the park is good because you have then a uh, certain type of uh, veggies next to the city, but you have also the, the central uh, cultural yeah, that people said, well, uh, you see the city, this is the sea, they said Conserola is the central park of, Bers of Barcelona. I, I think it's wrong. The central park of in Manhattan, the central park is a piece in the middle of the city and everything is around the city. But here is at the top of the mountain, you cannot call that the central park. It's like in Montreal, Montreal is the central park. No, it's a park in the middle of the city, but has another role. I mean, we should not... Uh, the concepts we have to be, it's too easy sometimes to use the same concept, we have to just test 
is that true or not? In a way, that I think is something that you can see. And then probably here, what happened is our mistake. We as a designer, we tend to imagine this is a line for the city and this is a line for the green. No. I think sometimes you can imagine that it's better if this line is this way. Because then you maximize the way and the, the advantage of the green and the city. If you do that, you can see that then you can imagine some facilities, imagine a hospital, a senior residence, places with public vocation could be better in near the park, and then the park can be entered into that. You can see this, and then you can see the way that these elements can start being activities like uh, other places where you can start playing with that. I mean, the city, if we want the nature into the city, means that we have to imagine green corridors into the city. We cannot just imagine that we do the city by streets and avenues. Eh? And then you start getting that where it's possible. This is the existing city, but how we can enhance these elements that they are moving from place to place. The same with the with the edge of the water. I know that also in, in the lake in Toronto you were also thinking that the, the edge is not one uh, homogeneous line. There are different activities as well. And I think that is what makes probably that space so Barcelona has thirty kilometers of uh, waterfront. It's fantastic. But you cannot make all that uh, for swimming. You need some natural spaces and that that could be the way, yeah? that the way that the persona, the first pitch of the city was this one, you can see the way it was. This is 85, this is 92. And this is not like the, the image of Paris, this is not Photoshop, this is a real thing. That was 84 and that is 92. And the city got five kilometers of beaches with sun and that we enjoy very much. To have a, a population of two million behind and having the beach with the subway uh, connected. I mean, this is uh, a fantastic opportunity. I know that you are also struggling with the same type of problem. Eh? But at the same time, would you like that, that some waterfronts could be quite natural when possible? And you can have also beaches where people can enjoy it, or you can have also renaturalize the dunes in some parts of the, of the beaches. Eh? And by doing that, you can see that then suddenly, when we were talking about how the city can be improved, that's clear, but also we can see how the green can become more the protagonist. Yeah? That's the way that then, what sometimes we use, by putting the blue and the green together, you make a system. And I think it's very important that we consider that our cities are always systems. And the same happened at the level of the, the communities. Yeah? When you see the communities, you can imagine how those spaces can be in ways. The final observation is about, I was saying before, our cities are like systems. But the systems needs to be efficient. <coughs> and probably one thing that we don't pay a lot of attention, but I'm sure you in your school, you are thinking that very much, is that the cities has to be, to work very efficiently. I think here is where the feel of the the rationale of the engineering are so important. In the end, the city, I don't like to see, um, like uh, our master de Corbusier was saying, well, the, the city, you remember that Corbusier was proposing, Chandigarh has had a body, uh, the, the city, well, it's not exactly, but it's true that our organism needs water, I mean, it has a certain, and the city is also has this. The way that, considering that the city is, is like that, and this is the exercise that they are doing with this book, which I think is very interesting in Chicago, where they are considering how could be more efficient the city that we have today, and considering how we can save energy, how we can make better use of the water, all these systems are essential for that. And we have to start, and for instance, in the case of Barcelona, we did this mapping. Could you see the city here? No. Because the city is very, the way that the metabolism of the city today, I don't know about Toronto, but our cities are really very irrational. 
because the people running the, the energy doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with the, with the corridor of the water or the sewage or the other. I mean, and then for us as designer, we have to start thinking how we can put these things more rationally together to save space and to make the space more efficient. For instance, that is an exercise being done in the outskirts of Barcelona. Is that is a place of the where for 30 years they put the garbage. They store the garbage in that place. When we're talking today about the metabolism, we are thinking more in the, in the recycling, all these types of things that they are coming. But for decades, they just put the things, huh? like in fresh kills in, in New York, we know. But fresh kill, which is under construction, Barcelona did already the fresh kills. You can see this is a park already done. It's a very successful park done in this space where you have to organize. Uh, of course, uh, the whole uh, system that needs to be treated, uh, then you have to control the, the water and how the water filters. I mean, there are certain mechanisms you have to do, but I think it's, it's nice to see that. But at the scale of the city, we did this exercise when we did this exhibit. Uh, fortunately, this model is very fragile. It was not possible to bring it here. But we did a very simple exercise. We took a couple of blocks of the city and we put where the pipes are. And what we did is we made the buildings, the walls of the buildings transparent. And then we have a discussion with, with the architects. And then we discovered that we architects, we tend to talk about the facade, the walls, the, the open windows, the bay windows, all these things, but we hardly talk about how the pipes are into the building and how the pipes could be more rational. That was a very interesting discussion. You have to do sometimes models just to to be able to, to discuss this element, because otherwise it's impossible. We feel, and the engineers feel that they do the job. Just put together and have this discussion. Then we come up to this idea of what happened underground, what happened in the buildings, but real things about where are the pipes into the buildings and what are the use of that. We discovered that all over buildings, and the same will happen if we do the exercise probably in Toronto, there are kilometers of pipes and, and wires and all these elements, and we don't pay a lot of attention. Perhaps you do more, uh, you do better, but in our, in our culture, this element is never considered seriously. And we are talking about the metabolism of the city, and we talk about, we want to make uh, better use of the energy. These issues are essential. Uh, it's not only the way that the installation of the building, but also the way that these things could happen. Yeah. Then designing the city what happened underground, yeah? well designed, and then probably we come up with the idea that probably if we imagine that the city of the future is going to be more um, comfort comfortable for the pedestrians and the spaces in between better, probably we have to count more about what happened below ground. I know that Toronto is a good example of that because you do many things underground. Nevertheless, I think to be very rational in the way we use below ground, I think it's something that should be taken uh, into consideration in many uh, cities. Then, most probably with this idea, the, uh, the metabolism of the city allows us this, uh, the need for networks that they are linking, networks where the water can filter down and can be connected. We know that the trees, if they are, if we have 100 trees, if they are connected, are more powerful in a way, and they are also probably better for the for the for the use and the health of the city and the person living in the city. And that probably was the reason that we come up with here. Also exploring, you can see the city um, how it works in certain hours, and the people are more concentrated in certain access during evening town in the other and so way. Today we have the power of techniques that we said today. Our cities are becoming more and more complex. I'm not so sure about that. I feel our we have tools where we can understand better how our cities. But I'm sure 50 years ago, our cities were already very complex. But the guys who were designing the city were unable to understand better the city. We have tools that are fantastic. But the only thing is we have to use them properly and try to synthesize these elements. 
for me, then the cities always has these opportunities, no? like to make places that everybody feels that they are nice. No? I feel that our commitment is always being able to create new places that also the people can be proud of it. No? At the level of the community or at the level of the metropolis. No? You know, today I was visiting this extraordinary uh, building, the art uh, museum, the Ontario Art Gallery. In fact, it's a building that everybody should be proud of uh, having the building like that. That corresponds to the scale of the, the metropolis or the country as well. But we have to find places that at the level of the small community, also the people like it to show, look at, because in my neighborhood we have that and we have these spaces, this garden. The, I think this is very important. The city doesn't need to be uh, defend that it's not only competing with the big landmarks, the big tower, the big elevator. Yes, but it's not only that. I mean, it's the community that feels also that the spaces are improving and are better in quality. And that is what uh, this exhibit uh, was trying to do. I really uh, feel that uh, that is probably what we uh, will try also to explain with this book that was very much about the city and the books that deal we are in the research that we are always doing. I'd like to stress, uh, finally, uh, give some time to the conclusion, I think our cities are always places where gathering people together. And in general today, we are facing with this new condition that I mentioned before, the condition that we have to, to understand the cities and present the cities in a way that our citizens can understand. Well, this is a mechanism that I'm sure you are using quite often. But we can probably, before I said, we can explain A, B, C, D, and that was a city. But sometimes we can say, and the people can understand, the city has certain armature, is the infrastructure, that has certain power in the green. They have different qualities that the people can understand and can control. I feel this is what is our job. To do a design for a city, doesn't mean that we have to make everything upside down. No, it means that we are going to twist, to change, to establish a certain strategy. Always considering that I feel we are facing, and that I insist, we are facing new ideas for the city. These ideas I mentioned today, these six, probably are more than six. We are in favor of the sustainability. We want that the green, the nature and the city come better together. We want cities that they are more uh, able to, to have better equity. I mean, those are things that a great deal of the population want. And those are the ideas. The problem is how we transfer these ideas into action. How we make from these ideas design proposal for the city. And that, I think this is what is challenging today, that we are facing not like these guys in the 60s that we were responding to the new mobilities of the city, they were so happy looking at that. Today, our job is putting together these ideas that sometimes we call the ideologies of the city with certain actions, that they are demanding also a lot of respond in, term, in technical terms, in rational terms, because we have to produce things that after a while it works, and after 10 years can be adapted and can be, and I think this is what is, is so important of our job. But at the same time, our job is, I insist on that, is a job that has the, the capacity of changing the cities. But we have to change the city not for the sake of changing or making this special building nice or nicer, but the idea that by doing that, we are able to respond to the main uh, challenges that the society wants. Uh, and that is when I feel that our job is, is getting uh, great and, and so important because we are able, and I, I feel that uh, as designers, we should not be uh, feeling that we are responsible of changing society, but we can help a lot in improving society and also changing society. I think this is the reason that this type of discussions about how these ideas can become actions is so important. And to be actions is through the design means. Yeah, and that I think is so essential. Right? That designing means not only architecture, not only landscape, 
is not also intervening in how the buildings of our actions can be also adaptable into the time. I mean, there are so many questions that I'm sure in a school uh, like your school and uh, is, a, is a cultivated uh, discussion, and I'm sure that is very important. Thank you very much. that this is a universal analytical model for any city in the world. Uh, where did the cultural values come in? I see you've done work in China, as lots of work in America, in Europe. Where do we infuse this unique aspects of those cultures? I think this is a, this is a very important point, thank you. I think the culture of the place is always unique and I feel this is something that makes all our cities uh, unique and different. I'm always defending that even because some people said, no, today with uh, Starbucks everywhere, uh, the cities are equal. It's not true. There are not two cities equal, even yet. And that, that is, has to do a lot with the history of the city. That's the reason why I feel when we uh, intervene, or we study, or we research one city, the history of the city and the history of the plans of the city, the ideas that they, I always like to study the plans that they have been executed, but also the plans that they are not executed, and the reason why they are not executed, but what we can learn from that. I think this is essential. I like it very much to study the history of the city, and sometimes even I've been forced to work with cities that I don't know the language. And I like very much. Because then you are forced to put your eye more precise, because then you have to discover the things by what is designed or what is not designed. But I had a long experience working in, in the Netherlands. I don't speak Dutch, unfortunately. I would like, but I cannot. But I could read the, the maps, and then I can discuss with people that they are Dutch speakers or Dutch, uh, and then you can come up with that. Our job, and that will be, but I'm, I don't feel that we are doing like a, a, an historian. No, our job is different, but we have to understand, that's what I'm saying, I'm looking at the maps of the city, but I'm looking at the plans of the city. Because I think nobody will do better, uh, nobody will do better than us, the studies of the maps, the actions, and the actions that they are proposed. Eh? But I think this is very important, and I, I'm completely convinced that even that we imagine that today also the architects are always traveling from place to place, and they are uh, anyway. But you have in the end to understand the logic of the city and to, to learn about that. Eh? Always, I'm quite pleased when uh, I'm working in one city and somebody said, "Okay, what you suggest in the reading of the city is new for us." I said, "Okay, finally we we got something for you." which in fact is, is our contribution in the end. Eh? I had a, bad, uh, a very interesting experience it was working in Toledo. Toledo in Spain is South Madrid. It's like our Kyoto. It's the city that is always the most uh, interesting historical city in Spain, no? from the south of, of the whole I Iberian Peninsula. And they invite us to do a research and proposal for them. They said, hey, attention. We, Toledo has been always this way. Don't propose anything. Uh, we are, uh, Toledo is, is this way. Okay, no? okay. We are disciplined, but then we start studying, and then we discover many changes, and we, honestly, we suggest to them. This day, I was almost fired. They said, no, no, it's impossible, you are wrong. Okay, okay. No, but this is what we discover. After a couple of weeks, they called me, okay, come back. <laughs> I, think, I think you were partially right, in a way. <laughs> anyway, why? Because 
everybody feels that the city that they see today or they uh, they they live is the city forever but then they don't take into account for instance in europe in the 19th century before the the big war they already destroyed the cities because they make other things as well and then you have to understand that and then you can say after that it's like paris everybody feels that paris has been always this way paris is a new city in the 19th century Fortunately for them, they have a beautiful city, but it was redone by somebody that has this capacity of changing the city. Thank you for your question, Matthias. Is there another question? Uh, back there. Yes. Well, um, we've kind of read about how uh, Barcelona is um, struggling this sort of uh, crowd of tourists that, uh, that Sometimes, or perhaps in some specific. Can we get the lights on? In some specific uh, periods during the year, the, the, the city is sort of overcrowded by tourists. Do you think it's a risk that, uh, obviously, Barcelona has been very successful in creating all those nice right. parks and spaces between buildings? And is it a risk that we sort of oversight that sure. we remove traffic and sort of in that way, uh, make uh, sure. the local communities feel sort of less connected to their own cities. I think, no, I think you're, 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 you're correct. I mean, there's a, there are two, two things in a way. Eh? That to have the problem of the tourism, I always feel is, uh, you know, I was working for the city in the 80s. Some friends from outside, they were coming to Barcelona and they said, okay, how is the city doing about gentrification? In that moment, it was already, this war was very good. I said, I would love to have gentrification. <laughs> and now the city is gentrified, it's better. The old town of Barcelona, I was, as, a, as a, somebody working for the city, I was buying houses <coughs> for two cents of a Canadian dollar. Okay. Today I cannot afford. Okay. Meaning that when you change the city, the prices are going up. But then you have to have certain tools to control that. The problem in Barcelona, if I could say, I'm not, I'm not in public, then I could say now, is that you cannot allow the city and the developers of the city do what they want. You have to control. And you have to establish certain scans and certain when the city of Barcelona did the, the major transformation of the old town, we passed a law that all the people living in the town, in the old town, has the right to stay in the old town. That means, that means a lot of public money as well. Eh? That is a, a major decision. Meaning that then you can start the rehabilitation of the old town, because you can refurbish, and then people living in bad conditions, they can improve in that place. But that, again, this is a planning a strategy that you need the support of the politicians, but you you have to create the conditions that the politicians like this type of thing. Right? What happened in Barcelona is being a successful city, and then they abandoned, they allowed any hotel what they want. Well, who cares about that? I mean, the mayor is responsible for that. I mean, the mayor and the and the people. I mean, you have to, in a way, I would say, always when you're improving, you have to control. That's when I was saying. When you do the knocking of the city, you can then de define certain rules for the transformation. And depending on how progressive is the politician government in the moment, you can go more or less. That could be. But sometimes in our job, I always feel people that they are working in our job saying, no, Johan, this is too risky. I remember that people did not say, no, this is not. It's not our job. Let the politicians know. Our job is to advise the people as deep as possible and as precise as possible. And then they will make choices. That that is very clear. Eh? And I always feel you know, the other uh, thing is I'm not entering into the political evaluation of the of the tourism. I feel that that is a new a new issue that you have to tackle. And I think today all these type of collaborative economy is making this happen in a way, not only in Barcelona, in general, in Europe, and I imagine also in America, no? that these ideas are the massive tourists, because also the flights are very, very cheap, 
that is there, uh, but that, that could be another discussion, Mr. Man. But uh, nevertheless, that means that that keeps us busy, Mr. Man. That means, but designing or intervening into the design of the city means that you never stop working for the city. You cannot imagine, well, the city is already fine, we just sleep. No, you cannot siesta, no. <laughs> you can always keep going, Mr. Man. And you have to look at where are the new problems, where are the, I mean, that's a, but that is a fortune for us, eh? then keep us peace. Thank you eh, for the point that this was. Okay, I think we'll take one last question um, at the back. Do you need um, a? I think I can speak up. Um, thank you very much. I've been a GIS analyst for quite some years, and it's very powerful to see these different layers of the system and how they connect. I'm just curious on your perspective, smart cities, Google, Sidewalk Labs, digital changes in the landscape. That's sort of a contrast to the way you see cities, which are more holistic, natural systems, and yet you use a lot of these digital tools. So as we move towards more performance-based planning, and measurement of outcomes. I'm just curious, do you do you see the future as more intuitive? The feel of cities is the, the humanist side, the way you think and prioritize different actions, or is the digital and the the measurement more important as we move towards the, the future of that technology? Well, honestly, I feel we have to play with with two with both. I mean. Uh, I think that these tools are so, that's the reason I was defending, these tools are so powerful that we need to use and to enter into that. But we have to to ask ourselves uh, what are the, how we can do it better, and what is for, in the way. And I think we have to be very uh, demanding about the way that these tools could be better uh, inspiring, eh, the way that, but, but I think today there is, uh, in, in my eyes, you know, that, you know, uh, you, you're familiar about this story. The Corbusier started thinking the cities in one shot after the first trip he did by plane to Moscow, 29. After that, he changed the way of designing the cities because he saw the cities from the plane. Okay. Today, we see the cities and everybody, and the young students, today, we see the cities from the Google immediately. Everybody already. The way that forces us to to look at more than that. We cannot just uh, make the things from the Google. We need to go, and I, I agree, we have to enter more into the detail of that. But I'd like that to imagine that we cannot produce the idea that was probably when I was learning, the idea of the black box. Uh, something that we don't know, and then pop up something. No, we have to be able that by different layers, that's the reason that we, in this exhibit, what we did, we try to say, we did like a different, Pieces. Each piece has to bring some elements into the to the table. And then the people can discuss. And, the, and of course, the, we as designers, we are able to understand better the things. But I like, I always feel committed that people should understand what we are doing. Otherwise, we we feel in the black box, uh, we are lost in a way. Eh? Because then is the technocracy in a way. People that they, they know how and that's it. No. This is, uh, I think, is wrong. In a way. That doesn't mean that because we have these powerful elements, that people feel, well, you do the design of a city in overnight. No, it's not true. We can better invest the, the time to do that. But, but with these tools, we can do better job. I mean, this is the, my conclusion. But I agree, we have to, to put the, what you mentioned, this humanistic approach in a way that the people can understand. And we have to imagine that human beings are the ones that should be up front. I mean, that's very clear. Yeah, wonderful conversation. I'm just going to hand the mic over to Professor Marco Polo, who is the curator of our gallery, and he's going to say a few words and then release you to the institution. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> I want to invite everyone here to uh, join us in transitioning to the next part of this evening, which is the um, uh, opening reception for the exhibition that documents much of the work that uh, Schwann talked about in his lecture. Um, before we do that, I just want to say some thank yous in connection to the exhibition, and in fact, 
to, to clarify that the exhibition is actually two conjoined exhibitions here in Ryerson. Um, the one being the uh, Barcelona Metropolis of Cities that is curated by Joan Busquets, and its companion exhibition, which is just outside the main gallery, Global South Metropolis of Cities, curated by Sheila McCartney of the um, Ryerson University School of Urban and Regional Planning. Um, and I want to uh, extend very big thank yous to both Joan and Sheila for bringing these exhibitions to us. Um, as Cheryl explained earlier, the lecture um, and also the exhibition are a joint project between the Department of Architectural Science and the School of Urban and Regional Planning. And I just want to say again, Sheila, thank you very much for bringing this project to us. It's been terrific. Um, we're working towards this event, and I'm very excited now to have the show up and running. Um, some additional thank yous to the teams from both uh, Department of Architectural Science and School of Urban and Regional Planning that worked on preparing the exhibition. From the School of Urban and Regional Planning, that team includes Lara Hintelman, Jeffrey Herskovitz, Courtney Kaup, and Florencia Sciuto. And from the Department of Architectural Science, Alexandra Gracianu, Leo Reutman, Mike Bartosek, Frank Bowen, Jordan So, and Jason Ramelson. And uh, assisting with installation, uh, a number of our students here at the Department of Architectural Science, Rachel Al, Joseph Ball, Anna Kosyshenko, Sean Patel, and Daniel Petrocelli. So thanks to everyone who contributed to bringing this together, and of course our sponsors for the, uh, for the exhibition. The Area Metropolitana de Barcelona, uh, the Ryerson University Office of the President, the Ryerson University Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Architectural Science, um, also the Dean of the Faculty of Community Services, and City Lab. Um, finally, I mentioned that, the um, a number of the publications that you saw towards the very end of Joan's presentation are, are available for purchase just outside this room. Uh, so please take a look at those on your way out. Um, and then finally, I just want to invite Sheila to say a few words about the exhibition before we release you to the reception. Thank you very much. And I just want to echo what Marco was saying about the, really the core team that brought this exhibition. That, you know, Marco said thank you me for bringing it, but it's clearly not just me that could do all of that work out there. Uh, and so the core team, I'm thinking about Lara Hinteman, who, with Jeffy Kurskowitz, went to Chicago, to her, to Illinois, to get the exhibit, to bring it back here, to um, launch those different pieces together, and also the core people here, uh, with Courtney Knapp and Florencia and Alexandra, uh, that began to put these pieces together, and through all of the ups and downs, sort of remained clear-headed and were able to uh, produce this great work outside. Uh, and of course, thank you again to our, our sponsors that allowed this to happen. So many of you may be thinking, what is this exhibit after this amazing lecture? Why now in Toronto? So despite the fact that, that we've been studying audiences, or Joan's exhibit has been studying audiences with insightful and innovative approach to city planning, here in Toronto we've been making a lot of decisions facing challenges and opportunities as we engage in projects that are giving shape to new urban forms, and we're seeing the direction of our city change and develop over the years. I consider this sort of a major sort of milestone in my lifetime to think of it the project that was proposed for the Toronto Waterfront, and that it's been coming to reality in the last 15 years, and to watch that project uh, unfold, sort of having a look at the plans, and also seeing it get built. So this, pro this pro promotes a wide ranging of debate of highlighting the contemporary issues in the 21st century that you heard Professor Bisquets discuss today, but also the issues and how they characterize new urban strategies for the functioning and the transformation of the city. So what is the future of the traditional city and the modern districts uh, constructed today? What are the new forms when we're thinking about accommodating emergent and innovative economies? What is the potential influence of hypermobility in increasingly on global centers? And what is the model for the 20th century and the 21st century as we move forward? This debate that we're beginning today draws the experiences of the area of Barcelona to serve as an international case study. We think of the urban realities and the projects there across global cultural regions with special attention to the Global South and the exhibit outside, but using strategy, strategies, but most importantly, also opportunities. And I think that that's something that um, Professor Busquets discussed lovely in his lecture today, that many of these things we think about as problems, but really they are the formation for amazing opportunities that we can use urban projects to address. And the exhibit offers an open field for reflection, a multidisciplinary approach, but involved in designing and importantly managing the city. We invite reflection and discussion of the challenges ahead, 
and the global cities as well as cities that work towards solutions and embracing their unique local contexts. So we look forward to welcoming you outside in the gallery. Please have a look through and enjoy the reception. And thank you very much for coming tonight. And thank you for to Professor Chris for coming.